Shall we begin, Kosh? Is that yeah, please do. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. I think good morning for a few of you. Uh, we welcome you all to the FW Champion webinar. This webinar is part of the Wilderness Training Program, which is conducted at the Vanghat Lodge in Corbett Landscape by Rewilded with Rare as a partner. Uh, to give a very quick brief about Rare, we are a uh, marketing sales and representation uh, company where we promote uh, small standalone boutique hotels across the Indian subcontinent. Uh, one Ghat is one of our uh, very dear partners at Rare. And uh, this is something that we've been really excited to promote uh, when uh, Samantha came up with uh, this concept of uh, you know, having this workshop uh, for Duff FW Champion along with James. So here we are this evening. Uh, before we go ahead, a few housekeeping rules. Kindly ensure that your microphones remain turned off at all times. Please add your comments or questions into the chat box and we can take them up later. Uh, so let's dive right in. We have Kushagra from Rewilded, who's going to give us a small brief about the program uh, at Vanghat. Kushagra hails from Bastar, Chhattisgarh, and uh, holds a master's degree in wildlife science from the Wildlife Institute of India. He's the founder of Rewilded, which is a team of biologists focusing on conservation and research education. Um, so over to you, Kushagra. Thank you, Shobhna. Hello, everyone. Uh, the wilderness... Okay, I can't. Uh, is is my screen uh, screen still on? Uh, yes, it's on, but it's on the first. Uh, uh, okay, slide. I don't know why I cannot move through the slides. Uh, maybe you'd like to reshare. Yeah, please. Can, uh, can the host make me stop sharing the screen? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I'm sharing the screen again. Is it visible to all of you? Yes, you can see. Uh, yes. You just need to go into full screen mode again. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, great. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Sorry for the small glitch. Um, thank you, Shobna. The Wilderness in the Wilderness Training Program stands for Wildlife Research, Nature Conservation Leadership, and Sustainability. It is a unique experience in the beautiful. Ram Ganga Valley of the Corbett landscape. It aims to provide an immersive experience of wildlife ecology, conservation, education, and sustainability. Our host, as you can see, is the beautiful Vanghat Lodge, which is undoubtedly one of the most eco-conscious and remote wildlife lodge in India. Coming to the wilderness training program, it is a field-based program. Here, people with academic background in wildlife science introduce participants to the world of ecology through guided excursions in forest, along with extensive discussions. It offers a wide variety of programs to cater to the interests, ranging from people wanting to know more about wildlife to corporates who are looking to, to mainstream biodiversity conservation in their operations, or even foreign students who are looking for an opportunity to spend a month learning about conservation in India. The goal here is to help more people across different age group and profession to see the natural world in a fresh perspective and also to prepare conservation leaders of tomorrow who are equipped with holistic understanding of our ecosystem and its various elements. Throughout the program, we ensure that every taxon is explained with the help of ecological theories and the latest developments in the research are presented in the simplest form. We have five modules focusing on birds, which we call symphonies of wild, mammals, which we call the bare necessities, the critters around us, forests, which we call unending connections. And we also have a module on conservation scenario in India, which we call from Indus Valley and beyond. In the conservation module, we discuss conservation policies, laws, and wildlife history of India. As a, part of, as a part of this module, we are here to discuss FW's contribution to Indian wildlife photography and conservation. But before I proceed, I have a small story uh, to narrate to all of you. I'm a student of forestry and I was, since the very beginning, we were told about 
champion in sets forest classification which was done by uh, hg champion and it was only during the orientation tour of the masters program of the wildlife institute of india while we were crossing from rajaji to lansdown through via koluchor and sane uh, forest rest house our faculty members told about another champion fw champion and this was the same region where fw used to used to work uh, he was the dfo once and ever since then i think i am i am influenced by i am inspired by his books uh, with a camera in tigerland and jungle in sunlight and shadow the only complaint which i think everyone who has read uh, f w s books these two books is that the in such a beautifully written book the photographs uh, were either torn off they were missing or when you download uh, the soft copies from the internet the quality was very poor <clears throat> uh, everybody uh, we have another champion among us james champion uh, who has been kind enough to share the photographs which fw took uh, about james james i think he's he he's you know a, a fantastic human being a naturalist a world traveler a passionate student of wildlife throughout his life and he is also the editor of a very much sought after book which is which has literally gone um, out of stock in the amazon right now trip fire for a tiger <clears throat> he has been meticulously archiving all records photographs and the legacy of his forefathers <clears throat> and he visited corbett first time in 1988 and trekked to pindari in 2006 on the same dates as his grandfather did in 1936 70 years back so here you can see fw facing the pindari glacier in the left and james uh, to the right <clears throat> he took photographs and stayed with uh, stayed in the same forest bungalows where fw did 70 years ago it must have been a wonderful experience and uh, you know to add to that james also met uh, also met descendants of the family members with whom fw worked he later came to india in 2014 and 15 for 6 months each uh, visiting other of champions haunts uh, one ghat in the wilderness training program is proud to be associated with james as a coordinator a mentor and a friend for life over to you james thank you very much uh, can you un- can you unshare your screen uh, yeah uh, please uh, shobhna yeah. ma'am can you un uh, stop sharing yeah. the screen thank, thank you very much Okay, good evening everybody. Thank you very much indeed for coming to this uh, event. Um it's a proud moment for me to be able to uh, join this team and um I'm very pleased to be able to uh, participate in this uh, event this evening. This evening I say because uh, I'm in Japan at the moment and it's uh, 8:30 or 8:40 in the uh, evening. But uh yeah, I know for for people around the world it's uh, different times all over the place. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the life and work of my grandfather FW Champion. Um Kush has already very kindly uh, given a little bit of an introduction uh, to him. Um certainly some people think that uh, my grandfather was a kind of father of wildlife conservation and certainly wildlife photography uh, in India and uh, he loved uh, the foothills of the Himalayas and the areas that are now the Corbett National Park and the Rajaji National Park and Dudwa so uh, those were his main kind of uh, photographic uh, haunts and also the places where he worked um he was born in 1893 here uh oh i can't move to the next slide what's happened okay yeah, james you're not screen sharing i'm not screen sharing yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to redo it okay let's redo it Hang on a minute. I don't know how to uh Ah, here we are. Just a moment. Okay. Now, can you mm. see it? Yes, we can, but you need to go back to the full screen. Back to the big screen uh, which yes. I'm now in on my computer. <laughs> yes. Is that okay for you? No, no. We're still uh, no. on your PowerPoint. Why? 
I don't know why. Uh, you might have to share that, uh, share your full screen. Uh, so when you click the share button, uh, maybe you could click on the full share full screen option. Yes, I already did. Um, I can't see how to do it. Share screen again. Yes. yes. Here we are. Here. Is that correct? Yes. 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 It's nice. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yes. Sorry about that glitch. Okay. But now I can't move to the next slide. Maybe down here. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. So my grandfather was born in 1893 in England. Um, and he was the fifth child of a great naturalist, George Charles Champion, and his wife Adelaide. Um, George Charles Champion was a well-known entomologist who worked for two Victorian millionaires called Godman and Salvin, who were doing a great study of the flora and fauna of Mexico and Central America. And they employed George uh, when he was 29 years old. He wasn't university trained. He was actually an assistant watchmaker and repairer in his father's watch shop in South London. But George had uh, been very much involved with the South London Amateur Entomologists Society and uh, various other insect uh, societies in uh, South London. And uh, he was a, a passionate uh, naturalist himself. And he had the kind of lucky break of his life when he was 29 years old. And he was sent to Guatemala for two years and then to Panama for another two years from 1879 to 1883. And uh, he then came back and worked in the Natural History Museum in London, cataloguing and describing all his uh, finds. And so my grandfather, as a child, was kind of brought up in that sort of uh, natural history circle. George Charles, as I say, spent four years collecting beetles and other insects in Guatemala and Panama. And he then worked, as I say, in the Natural History Museum, and he described more than 4,500 new species for science, which is a quite amazing uh, number. He also edited a huge work called the Biologia Centrali Americana, 58 volumes of them. They were huge books and uh, unfortunately just after they'd been printed, the first print run had been done, they were bombed in, uh, in a German air raid during the First World War and uh, they were all destroyed. Um, except the ones which had already been printed, but the uh, printing plates were destroyed. But luckily, the Natural History Museum and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington have scanned one of the few copies that still remain, so you can find them all on the internet. So that's basically uh, George's uh, contribution to FW's uh, life. He was also mentored by his uncle, Commander J.J. Walker, who was also a passionate insect uh, collector. So, uh, yeah, that was basically how F.W. started his natural history uh, career. Here are George and his mother, Adelaide. This was uh, obviously rather later in their lives. Uh, here's George when he was uh, younger and uh, just before he went off to Guatemala. And here is Commander J.J. Walker. So those were the two great influences in F.W.'s natural history life. Here's a picture of my grandfather when he was probably in his late teens. And here's a picture of the whole family. Um, you mentioned H.G. Uh, Champion. He was the eldest brother. And uh, this is H.G. Champion here. And this one is uh, F.W. here. The other brother, Reggie, was killed at the age of 22 uh, in the First World War in Belgium. But he'd already published a few papers on uh, insects and uh, he would have certainly gone on to be uh, a great natural historian uh, himself if he'd lived. The, the, the girls were also extremely interested in uh, natural history. And this one here, Dora, she actually married uh, an IFS officer called R.A. Parker, who was responsible for setting up the, uh, uh, the gardens of the FRI in Deradun. So they were very much a, a family of, uh, of natural historians. Here's a picture of them a bit later. Um, and uh, it looks as if uh, George Charles is kind of falling asleep here, but uh, I think he must have been very proud anyway of, uh, of his children. Now, F.W. took up photography 
um, in 1909. And this was one of his very first pictures of a lapwing, uh, which was taken uh, close to their house in Woking in Surrey to the southwest of London. And here is a picture of a great tip that he took uh, also in 1909. Uh, the kind of camera he was using, I'm not really sure what camera it was, but uh, it must have been fairly primitive and uh, it must have been very difficult to get this kind of uh, photograph. Here's a coal tit also uh, taken in his garden. He also took uh, other animals. Here's a natterjack toad, which is quite a rare species in the UK recognizable by a yellow stripe down its back. You can't see that it's yellow, but you can see that it's pale. And a grass snake and an adder. Now, FW wasn't very popular with his sisters because he would bring some of these creatures home and he kept the snakes in the bath. So when uh, the girls or when his brothers wanted to take a bath, they had to remove the snake first. And uh, some of them were not very keen on that. Now, he started the wildlife photography at a very early age, as I say. He took his first photographs of night jars, which had never been photographed in the wild before when he was aged 17. But he had some problems with the noisy shutter on the camera, which he recorded in his diary. And as you can see, it says, when I pulled the string to open the shutter, the bird jumped about an, a yard in the air with fright, utterly spoiling the plate. Now, one of the things that we kind of tend to forget these days with, uh, with digital photography is that we can take an unlimited number of photographs and it's free and we can just delete the ones we don't like. But of course, in those days, FW had to spend all his pocket money on uh, glass plate negatives and every one that was spoiled was, uh, you know, a significant proportion of his, uh, of his weekly pocket money. But here is one of the nightjar pictures that he successfully took in 1910. And uh, you can see how well camouflaged the, the nightjar was, but it's a very sharp picture. And here's another one. What he would do is he would go out before dawn and watch where the nightjars settled um, just uh, as the sun came up. And then he would go back later in the day when the light was better and photograph the bird while it was sleeping in the place where it had settled early in the morning. He also found a nest and here we can see two nightjar chicks. Uh, I think this is probably the only photograph I've ever seen of nightjar chicks. And here we can see a page from his photograph album and you can see the nest down at the bottom of a tree here. Here are the eggs and there's the nightjar actually sitting. Uh, I don't think that's on the same nest. I think that's a different nest. Here's another page from his photo album. Very nicely uh, laid out. Now, he had a great dream to travel to India because once he'd started wildlife photography um, back home, photographing the uh, animals and birds close to his home seemed a little tame. And he was longing to photograph uh, something rather more exciting. And his main uh, dream was to take photographs of, of a tiger. He traveled to India for the first time in 1913 but he couldn't get into the forest department or, or whatever, and he hadn't even been to university at that stage. And the only way that he was able to find to get to India was to join the police. So he joined the Indian police and was posted to the police training college in Maimen Singh in East Bengal, which is now in Bangladesh, but there's still a police training college there. And at the start of the First World War, he joined the Indian army and he was commissioned into the cavalry and he was seconded to the Kurum militia, which is now a part of the Pakistan army. And um, he was uh, stationed in a place called Parachinar in the Northwest frontier. Here's a picture of him, rather a wonderful picture, I think, um, in uh, the mountains on the borders of Afghanistan. And he served uh, with that militia throughout the First World War and uh, was mentioned in dispatches um, for his uh, gallantry. Uh, here's the officer's mess in Parachina, which, uh, of course, I will never be able to visit because it's too dangerous to go there. But uh, I looked for it on Google Earth and found it, and it's still there. So, uh, yeah, there it is in the winter. And here are some magnificent mountains that he photographed during the First World War. Now, when he came back, he was uh, demobilized from the army in 1919 
with the rank of captain. And he then returned to the UK and he was incredibly lucky to get a scholarship to do a shortened forestry course uh, at Oxford University. The, uh, the forest department in India was uh, desperately in need of, uh, of new recruits because many of them had been killed in the war. And so they organized a shortened course for recruits at Oxford University. And he graduated top of his class in 1922. And he then joined the Indian forest, uh, well, he joined the forest department and uh, moved back to uh, India. Here's a photograph of the, uh, the School of Forestry in Oxford uh, in 1921. And here we can see FW next to the professor, Professor Schlick, who uh, was in charge of the, uh, of the forestry course. And here we can see the last of the old brigade. Uh, you may notice that these are all Britishers. Um, from uh, that year on, they uh, started uh, recruiting uh, Indians. And uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, this, this was How FW's... Uh, this, this was FW's uh, class, 19, uh, September 1921. Okay, now he traveled, as I, as I said, he traveled to India in 1913 with the definite ambition to produce photographs of tigers, but he hadn't been able to achieve that because there was no opportunity as a policeman and he had uh, been serving uh, during the war up on the Northwest frontier where of course there were no tigers. He didn't achieve his ambition until 1923, 98 years ago. Um, he also took up flashlight photography and he pioneered the camera trapping technique using a tropical water plate uh, Sanderson camera with trip wires and pressure pads. I'll talk more about that a bit later. Uh, he also used another kind of camera, which was a Soho quarter plate APM reflex camera by day, often from the back of his uh, well-trained elephant Balmati, who took him on many of his uh, photographic expeditions. Um, he tried to persuade Jim Corbett to take up photography and filming and to do a little less tiger and leopard killing. Um, and Corbett uh, acknowledged that uh, the person who inspired him uh, to take up photography was indeed F.W. Champion. He also photographed insects coming from an insect loving family. Here we have uh, a couple of common Mormon butterflies and a rather magnificent moth. Anyway, he finally achieved his ambition and he used this, uh, cam this camera trapping uh, technique, which was called tripwire photography in those days. So what he would do is he would place his very large camera um, on a small tripod next to the path, which he knew a tiger was using regularly. And he would camouflage it with leaves and he would then connect the camera to a magnesium flash, which he actually had to spoon the magnesium powder into. And there was also a battery. Uh, he would focus the camera on where he thought the animal's face would be if it touched the wire. And he then left the area and hoped for the best. What he used to do initially was to sit up in a tree waiting for the flash when an animal came, but he was bitten by mosquitoes on many occasions and got the most terrible bouts of malaria. So uh, my grandmother advised him that this was perhaps not such a wise idea. Of course, we, all, we, we have to remember that only one exposure could be taken per night. So as I mentioned before, it was uh, quite expensive and uh, it took him a long time before he was able to actually achieve his ambition of getting a successful photograph of a tiger. Um, but here is his first picture uh, of a tiger, first successful picture of a tiger taken in 1923. This one, of course, was not taken with the uh, camera trapping technique. This one was taken by day. But uh, anyway, it was uh, the first of his tiger photographs. But here we can see one that was taken using the tripwire technique. So he must have put the trip, the tripwire somewhere near this bait. Um, and uh, it was fired off by the tiger when it pulled the, the bait, which was tied. And uh, so that was the kind of photograph that he got uh, by using baits. 
Um, and here is a rather long-faced and strange-looking tiger that he also took. This one was definitely used, uh, definitely taken using the tripwire technique. Here's another one. Um, he took hundreds, really, of these photographs, and uh, yeah, he was quite uh, self-critical. So many of them, unfortunately, he threw away. But uh, we still have quite a few of them. Here's another one. In most of these pictures, you can't see the tripwire. But later on, there's one or two, there are one or two where you can, and I'll point them out uh, to you when we get there. Of course, he didn't know what animal would come along, and he also didn't know what direction it would come along in. So it was all a bit hit and miss, but uh, here's a picture of a leopard that uh, he got, a very successful picture. Um, and here's one um, where he'd set up the camera close to a kill, and uh, obviously when the leopard came in, it tripped the wire and uh, this kind of photograph was taken. This is one of my favorites. It's a big male leopard. Um, and uh, sometimes he put the camera sort of facing down the path, but sometimes he put the, the camera like, uh, as in this picture, so that he could take the picture from the side. And uh, some of them were remarkably sharp. And when we think that these pictures were taken nearly a hundred years ago, they're pretty amazing, really. Now here we can see a very lovely kind of ghostly leopard moving along the path. I love this one. It seems to have a sort of aura around it. Here's a hyena. Um, in those days, uh, hyenas were still fairly common. It almost looks deformed, this one, because uh, the front leg seems to be almost in the same position as the back leg. But they're very un ungainly animals, so uh, I guess it's just normal. But anyway, uh, yes, he got quite a few pictures of uh, hyenas. Here's a pangolin. Of course, we all know what terrible troubles uh, pangolins are in these days. But uh, this was a pangolin that was brought into uh, FW's camp and he wanted to take a photograph of it, but it was moving around. So he put it in a tea chest and sat on top of it while he was getting his camera ready. And apparently the pangolin was so strong that it pushed him off the... Uh, off the tea chest. So that kind of uh, illustrates how strong pangolins can be. Now here's a, a sloth bear that he took next to a termite mound. Um, he obviously got quite a few uh, sloth bear pictures. And this is a particularly famous one because here you can see two babies on the back of the mother sloth bear. Before that, it wasn't really known that sloth bears habitually take uh, carry their babies on their backs. So again, a very nice picture. And this is basically the kind of photography that FW became famous for, uh, for doing. He also did a lot of daytime photography. Here's a very beautiful family of Nilgai. And it's amazing how they almost look as if they've posed for the camera. Um, he had a very good eye for composition. But composition of landscape photography is one thing. Composition of uh, animal photography is rather more difficult because you can't tell the animals to go and stand in the position you want them to be in. So this is a kind of example of the, of the, of the beautiful uh, uh, photography that he did. Here again, you've got a lovely female Nilgai with her calf uh, looking away uh, to one side. And uh, again, it's almost as if he told them to look in that direction. Here are some black buck. In those days, black buck were quite common in the plains of uh, of UP, and uh, so he got uh, quite a large number of photographs of them. He also tried his hand at bird photography, and here we have a, a Himalayan pied kingfisher, or crested kingfisher, um, and here's a very beautifully uh, composed picture of uh, a flock of vultures in a tree. It's not so easy to see so many vultures together these days, but uh, yeah, anyway, uh, very, very attractive uh, photograph. And here's a particularly famous shot that he took of a Lamagaya perched on a tree with Nanda Devi in the background. Um, Nanda Devi was uh, in those days the highest mountain in India. Of course, nowadays uh, it's not because uh, at that time Sikkim was not, uh, not a part of India. But uh, yeah, these days Nanda Devi has lost its uh, place as the highest mountain in India. But anyway, it's a beautiful picture, and he knew that Lamagai is frequently perched on that particular branch, so he would go and set up his camera and wait. But this is his most famous tiger photograph, 
and you can see how beautifully composed it is. It appeared on the front of many publications, but FW, as I mentioned before, was a very self-critical person, and this was a series of comments that he made about that particular photograph. He said, now this photograph, although it is one of my better efforts, still has several faults. Wild elephants unkindly removed half of my carefully arranged bamboo arch. If we go back to the picture, you can see some bamboo here, but originally he also had bamboo here and it would have made a perfect arch, but apparently some elephants came along before the picture was taken and removed half of the bamboo. Then he says the tiger blurred his foreleg by movement. And here we can see that yes, the front paw is slightly out of focus. And he said the leg is not posed in an artistic manner. Well, I'm not sure what the tiger would have thought about that, but um, anyway, that was FW's self-criticism. And then he said the track is too straight and too broad. Well, I suppose you could say that's the case. And the head and forelegs are too large in proportion to the hind quarters. Well, I suppose uh, that's because the tiger is facing towards the camera. And uh, finally, he says the tail is concealed. Actually, you can just see the end of the tail. But really, to, to be so self-critical uh, was kind of characteristic of my grandfather. He never did anything by half. And uh, so he was always striving to do better in everything that he did. Now, this is one of the cameras that uh, he, he used. This is the one he used mainly for the daytime photography. And we actually still have that camera in our house in Scotland. And uh, of course it doesn't work anymore, or at least we haven't tried to make it work. Um, but anyway, it's still there. Now, my grandfather married, um, got married in 1923 in Lansdowne. And, uh, his wife, my grandmother, had malaria at the time, so she was feeling pretty ill and she had to sit down during the, uh, the photographs because she was feeling so ill. Here you can see the bridesmaids arriving at the church on an elephant. It was quite an event. Um, her father was uh, Major General Sir Keith Stewart, um, who later became Colonel-in-Chief of, of the Royal Garoual uh, Rifles Regiment. Um, here we can see a picture of my grandmother um, and uh, she traveled with my grandfather everywhere he went in the jungles. So uh, she, she also loved her life uh, in India. Here's the classic picture of my grandfather. Actually, there aren't that many pictures of my grandfather because he didn't like being photographed and he never handed over his camera to anyone else to take pictures of him. So it's actually quite difficult to find photographs of him. And there's one picture that I would really like to find, and that is a picture of him with Jim Corbett. And so far, I've never found one, but they were quite close associates, and they both served on the steering committee for the founding of the Haley National Park in 1936, which later became the Corbett National Park. They had two children, my aunt Jean, here she, uh, she, she is, uh, they, were, they both spent the first years of their lives in India. Here's Jean. And here's my father, Nigel, and you can see in this picture the tripwire. This is one of the very few pictures which actually show the wire. If you look here, you can see a metal pin sticking out of the leaves. And if you look over here very carefully, you can also see another metal pin. And between the two, if you look really, really carefully, you can see the wire going under my father's hand and passing across to the other pin. So what would happen is that the tiger would come along or the other animal would come along. And then if my grandfather was lucky, it would touch the, the wire um, and uh, put its weight on the wire, which would automatically fire the, uh, the flash and uh, the picture would be taken. But of course, the chances of success were quite low. Um, my father actually fired off this tripwire by accident, I think, playing. You can see my grandfather's legs in the background, 
And apparently my father got quite uh, severely chastised afterwards for wasting a plate, but I'm glad he did it because it's a, a very historic photograph. Here you can see the two children together um, with my grandmother. Um, unfortunately, both of the two children were sent home to the UK at the age of eight, um, which was the normal thing uh, in those days. So from the age of eight to the age of uh, 18, my father hardly saw his, children, saw his uh, parents because of the war. And uh, so I think it was a very hard thing for both the parents and the children. Here's a picture of uh, my grandfather and my grandmother. And I think my father on Balmati, uh, this was taken at a place called Buxar, which uh, is uh, in the Corbett National Park, but I think it's now underneath the Ramganga Reservoir. And here's a picture of my uh, grandparents here and their best friends who were in the, uh, or the, the gentleman was in the Royal Garal uh, Rifles Regiment and uh, their, their daughter, Rosemary, uh, traveled with me uh, in 2014 and 2015 uh, back to the places that she remembered from her childhood. And it was a very emotional uh, kind of uh, journey for her. And very interesting for me because she was able to tell me stories about my grandparents that uh, I didn't know. So that was uh, quite something. We can see that my grandmother is carrying a camera here, but I don't know which camera that was. Here we can see my grandmother with a ratel that was brought into the camp. I would have thought that ratels would be quite uh, uh, vicious and could easily bite, but uh, she doesn't seem to be worried about uh, carrying the ratel in her hands. Here's a beautiful picture taken from Kosani, looking across towards uh, Trisul here and uh, Nandagunti and uh, uh, the, the great mountains of the, of, uh, of the Himalayas. And here we can see a lovely picture of uh, three of my grandfather's assistants, one of them pointing away across here to Nanda Devi. And here we can see Nanda Court over there as well. And the Pindari Glacier, which uh, is actually up here, and uh, it was to that glacier that my grandfather and my grandmother and my father at the age of eight trekked in 1936. And um, I retraced their footsteps in 2006. Um, here we can see a very beautiful picture of uh, some uh, clouds in the, uh, in the mountains. And uh, FW had a very good eye, as I mentioned, for landscape photography. And so here we can see uh, the, the beautiful clouds uh, uh, in the hills. Now, FW Champion did do some big game shooting when he was in the army. I think mainly due to peer group pressure because that was what uh, was expected of soldiers. Um, but he hated it and he gave it up after seeing so much bloodshed during the Great War. And he pioneered and encouraged the use of the camera instead of the rifle. He served, uh, as Kush already mentioned, as DFO in Lansdowne and various other places uh, in, uh, in Kumaon and in Garwal, and also in, uh, what, what, in UP. Of course, it was all UP in those days. He played an important role in the setting up of the Haley, which later became the Corbett National Park in 1936. And he was appointed conservator in 1940. He campaigned for the conservation of wildlife and better treatment of animals in captivity. That's another thing that's perhaps not so well known about him. He hated to see big cats and other animals pacing around uh, in cages, small cages with concrete floors. And he campaigned uh, against that. And later he was involved with the setting up of Whipsnade Zoo, which was the country branch of uh, London Zoo, where the animals had uh, a much uh, greater area to be able to, to move around in. Now he also took up cine filming and he used 16 millimeter film. Um, and actually even before the second world war, he had managed to get some color film. This is actually from, I think from before the war, but he had to revert to black and white uh, film um, because the supplies of color film ran out during the war. He had a Bell and Howell uh, cine camera, which was clockwork, and we still have it at home. 
Um, I don't think it would work if we actually tried, but uh, you never know. Uh, here it is. Bell & Howell Company, Chicago, Filmo, um, made in the USA. And here you can see the actual clockwork winder. Um, so uh, that was quite a sophisticated uh, piece of equipment in those days. Jim Corbett actually bought exactly the same camera. Now, as Kush mentioned, uh, my grandfather wrote two books. The first one was with a camera in Tigerland, which was published by Chateau and Windus in 1927. And the second book was The Jungle in Sunlight and Shadow, also published by Chateau and Windus in 1934. But he also wrote numerous articles in magazines and journals such as the Illustrated London News, Country Life, The Field, the Indian State Railways Magazine and other publications. And um, here we can see uh, a rather not very sharp picture of the original cover of With a Camera in Tigerland. And here is uh, a picture of the cover of The Jungle in Sunlight and Shadow. Of course, most of the copies of the books that we can find today don't have these dust covers anymore. So uh, it's quite difficult to find them. Here's one of his pictures on the front cover of the Illustrated London News in 1929. And here is uh, the first page of a series of articles he wrote uh, about big game photography for beginners. That was also uh, run in the Illustrated, no, that was run in the field, which is a famous uh, hunting and shooting magazine in the UK. Um, here's a picture taken by him on the front page of the Illustrated London News again. And here's his most famous one, the one that he was so self-critical about on the front cover of the Illustrated London News. Here's uh, uh, an article that he wrote in India magazine in February 1930, The Senses of the Tiger. Some of the uh, articles appeared in the two books that he wrote, but some of them were standalone articles and uh, appeared only in those magazines. Here's a lovely kind of uh, montage of his uh, photographs in the uh, center pages of a copy of the Illustrated London News. And here's one of his uh, other most famous uh, photographs, again, from the Illustrated London News. And here's the original photograph. This is a particularly famous photograph, which actually illustrates a tiger that had seen its reflection in the camera and it wasn't happy about that. And uh, down the right-hand side of the, of the uh, page here, he recounts uh, how the tiger sprang at the camera and knocked it over. But uh, luckily uh, it wasn't damaged. And this is the photograph that resulted from that. Here's the original photograph. Now he also took, uh, he also took a lot of daytime photographs. And here we can see a tigress, which he and my grandmother spent four days with photographing uh, uh, the animal as it just went about its, uh, its daily routine. Um, of course, in those days, the tigers were heavily shot. So obviously this one had kind of realized that FW didn't pose any kind of threat to it. And so it allowed him and my grandmother to stay close by and watch them for this four day period. He uh, was awarded a certificate of merit for his photography um, by the Country Life magazine, and it was awarded uh, at the British Museum of Natural History in London, which is now just called the Natural History Museum in London. But the, I can see that this was actually uh, a competition that took place between October 1935 and January 19, was it 35 or 55? No, 35. Um, but of course, FW was in, uh, was in India at that time, so I don't know uh, who would have received the certificate and sent it to my grandfather. He also received an OBE for his services to, uh, uh, to forestry and also for his contributions to the war effort. And uh, here we can see the uh, recommendation or the commendation that uh, he received. As a senior officer of the forest department of this province, you have played a big part in the department's unprecedented commitments to the defense department. This fine effort has in a great measure been due to your enthusiasm and drive. During the last four difficult years, you have had very serious and unforeseen difficulties to contend with, but you have faced and overcome them with cheerfulness and efficiency. 
I'm extremely glad that you've been appointed an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire, and I congratulate you on this well-deserved honour. So that was FW's OBE citation. Now, he retired from the Indian Forest Service and from forestry in India uh, in January 1947. He was only aged 54. Um, and of course, as with most of the other Britishers, including Jim Corbett, um, they all, well, well, most of them left uh, India, but he was unable to obtain a passage uh, on a ship for six months due to the fact that all the other Brits were leaving. And uh, he wasn't really quite sure what to do during the rest of the time that he was going to be remaining in India. But my father visited, um, my father was in the Navy at that time, and he got three days leave, having not seen his parents for 10 years. He got three days leave to visit them at North Kerry in what is now uh, the Dudwa National Park. And he flew up from Bombay, I think to Lucknow, and then took the, uh, the train, the old and terrible railway, as it was known in those days, the Ud and Terai Railway. And uh, he spent uh, one full day with them. And he suggested to my grandfather that he take up the study of butterflies. Um, my father then flew back to Bombay again and uh, took up his duties on the ship again. Um, but uh, my grandfather took that uh, to heart, coming from an entomological family, and he started collecting butterflies very avidly during that year, 1947. And he travelled to, uh, he was, well, he was in Nainital, and then he travelled to what was in those days called Pune, Pune and Karwa down on the coast uh, just to the south of Goa, and also in uh, a place called Kandala in the Western Ghats. And here are some of his butterflies, which we still have uh, at home in Scotland, here as part of his collection. Um, and uh, yeah, he made a pretty magnificent collection. And uh, then after that, in December 1947, he and my grandmother left India on a ship, but they didn't go back to the UK. They took a ship to Cape Town because uh, FW's sister, Dora, as I mentioned, she uh, was married to another ex-Indian forest officer, and they had uh, taken up residence uh, in his retirement near Cape Town. So they went on a ship to visit uh, uh, them in, in, in South Africa. And while they were on the ship, they met the secretary of the governor of Tanganyika. Of course, now that's uh, Tanzania. And uh, the governor mentioned that uh, perhaps FW might like to take up a forestry position in East Africa. And eventually he was appointed uh, deputy conservator, conservator of forests in Tanganyika. And he had responsibility for the Serengeti and the Kilimanjaro air, area. So as you can imagine, uh, he was in seventh heaven again able to continue with his wildlife uh, observations, not in India, but in East Africa. I don't know whether he met Jim Corbett during that time. Corbett had uh, retired to uh, Kenya, and I would imagine that they must have met, but I don't have any records of, uh, of that meeting. He covered the Serengeti, and he continued his photography, but he didn't do uh, any tripwire photography when he was in East Africa. He used a 1937 Leica, just a small one, which we also still have at home. That one does work. I tested it with a film not that long ago. Um, but he found that the photography in East Africa was a little too easy um, because he said that the animals were out on the open plain and it was much more of a challenge to uh, photograph them in India. So, uh, yeah, I don't think he found his uh, East African photographic experiences uh, quite so exciting as he had in India. He also filmed, he used his uh, Bell and Howell 16 millimeter uh, cine camera a lot in East Africa, but he was a bit discouraged because Walt Disney uh, sponsored uh, a team of uh, animal photographers who arrived at the time when he was, uh, when FW was there. And of course they were far better equipped and uh, were using really professional equipment. And so he, he kind of thought, oh, well, I'll never be able to compete with Walt Disney. So he kind of gave up his uh, filming. But he remained in contact with Jim Corbett anyway, certainly by letter. Here's one of my grandfather's photographs of a giraffe in front of uh, Kilimanjaro. And here's one of an elephant uh, browsing on a tree. 
Um, and uh, then in uh, 1954, he retired and he didn't have a house in the UK, but my grandmother had a very beautiful uh, property in Southwest Scotland, which she'd never lived in. Um, it had been rented out to the Dukes of Bedford as their Scottish uh, shooting lodge. And uh, when the, the then Duke of Bedford in 1952 decided that he didn't want to uh, continue the lease, the house was then left empty. And uh, my grandfather said to my father, who'd inherited it, in fact, he said, if you would let my mother and me live in the house for the rest of our lives rent free, we'll look after the house. And so that's, that was the arrangement that, uh, that uh, was followed up. He took up gardening and he restored the garden of that absolutely beautiful uh, house. And he planted a lot of rare trees and shrubs, many of them from the areas in India that he remembered and my grandmother loved so much. And the garden is still quite regularly visited by uh, the International Dendrology Society and other horticultural organizations. And finally, F.W. died in 1970, aged 76. I was born in 1963, so I remember him from my very uh, young days, um, but uh, I was only seven when, uh, when he passed away. My grandmother continued uh, living in that big house until she died in 1983. Uh, and then my parents uh, moved there in 1988. And uh, my father is no longer around, but my mother is still living there at the age of 93. This is the house. As you can see, it's really a, a fabulous place. And you can just imagine how happy F.W. and my grandmother were living there. You can see some enormous rhododendrons here uh, in front of the house. And uh, when they flower in uh, May, then the whole place looks absolutely marvelous. So they were very, very happy uh, living there in their retirement. There's a picture of the house, quite a splendid place. So basically, uh, I would conclude that FW's work is not forgotten, and he's now seen as a founding father of Indian wildlife conservation, which I think he'd be very touched to know, because he was actually a very modest man and uh, never really blew his own trumpet. Um, he influenced many of uh, the people who call themselves wildlifers today, and uh, I think, again, he'd be very impressed by the work that a lot of uh, the current generation of uh, wildlife conservationists are doing in India. Uh, a lot of the work is uh, that, that he, on, on the issues that he felt were important uh, are still uh, or is still being done and uh, a lot of progress in, in, in many ways is being done uh, or is being made so I think he'd be very pleased about that. Um, obviously tigers as we know have declined from around 40,000 uh, perhaps at the beginning of the 20th century to maybe 2,900 now today in India. But uh, great efforts are being made to, uh, to look after those. And uh, I know that some of you who are attending this meeting are involved in that. So uh, I thank you in the name of my grandfather for uh, all the amazing work that you do. Um, obviously, organized poaching and, uh, and uh, the illegal trade in tiger parts for traditional Chinese medicine is really a, a major issue. Uh, and uh, I think supporting the low paid and sometimes ill-equipped forest guards is, uh, is also something that uh, is very important. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Um, I'll unshare in a minute and then we can open up for questions. Um, Kush mentioned that uh, I produced a book called Tripwire for a Tiger. It's an anthology of uh, some of FW's articles and I published it in 2013 and uh, it sold out. And as Kush mentioned, if you go to Amazon, you can't find it now. But I was in touch with my publisher today. Uh, I don't know if she's here in the meeting today. I don't, I don't think she was able to attend. But um, anyway, she said that if anybody's interested in buying a copy of Tripwire for a Tiger, they should write to her at prema at rainfedbooks.com. She has just a few copies left from the first print run. And uh, if you're interested, you'd be welcome to, uh, to uh, write to her. So anyway, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I shall stop the share and let's see what happens. Now. 
Right, there we are. Uh, thank you so much, James. Um, you're very Kush, welcome. If you're, <laughs> yeah, Kush, if you're around, uh, yeah, yeah, you can take over the questions, please. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, James. It was it was wonderful to you know listen to the stories of FW, and uh, you know we did not know that much about FW, and you told as you mentioned that he went to Africa uh, yes. after uh, independence. Uh, so I think we should open the forum for questions now. Um, I'm sure there must be a lot of questions people might be wanting to ask. Uh, so yeah, uh, we are open for questions now. <laughs> yeah, but maybe everybody's too shy. Ah. There are definitely okay. com compliments pouring in. So. Yeah, yeah, some compliments coming in in the chat. Thank you very much. Yeah, Kishore Rite says uh, amazing pictures and his journey. Shalini, <laughs> thank you for the lovely presentation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 love, I love to, uh, uh, you know, share the photographs and to uh, talk about the experiences that my grandfather and my grandmother had in India. And uh, it's a great privilege to me, really, to uh, be able to, you know, pass on this knowledge to the younger generation of conservationists, because I think they can be inspired, really, by this work that they, uh, that my grandparents did all those years ago. I can see that there's one question. Ishika is here. Uh, go ahead, Ishika. She had a question. Somebody had a question, but now they've disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Hi, James. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I am Anand Shankar. I am an Indian Forest Service officer myself. Yes. And uh, I am fortunately born and brought up in the same area where your grandfather has worked. Wow. In the Uttarakhand. Yeah. So. Yeah, just one question. I was looking uh, for the books written by your grandfather, but I could not find them. If you can kindly help me with getting the copies of those books or something, it would be <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, I I don't really know how to find them. Um, I know that um, Natraj uh, published uh, or republished the books uh, probably in the 1990s without my authorization, which I wasn't too happy about. Um, but uh, uh, maybe some of those are still available. I'm not sure, but I would guess you probably want the originals. Yeah, yeah I'd love to have okay. it and purchase it perhaps, yeah. Okay, well, I think probably the best thing to do is uh, if, I, uh, if, you, if you send me a message so that I can find your email address, then I'll keep my eyes open. And if I come across any copies, I'll forward uh, the details to you. Well, wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah. You're very welcome. Any more questions? Yeah, James, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, I was curious to know uh, 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 Champions work with Bombay Natural History Society, but you have not given any reference with, with this talk. No, no. Except the British yeah. Yes, well, I don't know whether he worked in, in, in any way in, in, in conjunction with the Bombay Natural History Society. I do know that there were two articles that he wrote which were published in their journal, one of which was about the mouse deer and another one was about uh, tiger tracks. It was about the position of the paws when the tiger was walking and how you could uh, uh, identify different things about how the... Uh, uh, about how the tiger was moving and about the age of the tiger and so on. Um, and I think that those are the only two articles I know of which were published in the journal of the BNHS. Um, but I don't think he worked actually really with them because actually, of course, all this wildlife stuff that he did was really a kind of hobby. And um, his main work was uh, regular forestry. So I don't know whether he was actually actively involved with the BNHS. He was obviously a member, um, but I don't think he went to Bombay to uh, give any talks or whatever. And of course it was only really, I don't know, perhaps it was late on in his career that people really began to recognize him as uh, a person who was making a major contribution to uh, wildlife conservation. Um, and in fact, in some circles, he wasn't very popular because 
most of his contemporaries enjoyed hunting and shooting. And when FW started to mention the fact that perhaps they might like to observe the wildlife rather than killing it, and perhaps they might like to take up photography instead of shooting and killing the animals, of course, they felt threatened. And in fact, quite recently, I've uh, been reading uh, the diaries of H.G. Champion, his elder brother. And when I read you know, that Harry Champion went out uh, shooting uh, often big game every evening after he'd done his forestry work, you know, I find it kind of uh, a little horrifying, really. I know it was different times and I know my grandfather didn't like that, but it must have been difficult for him because his contemporaries didn't like being criticised and even his elder brother and his elder brother's wife, Crystal, they, uh, they were very keen shooters. So it must have been a very difficult thing, I think, for my grandfather to, uh, to put across his ideas because most people didn't understand and they didn't like to hear these criticisms. So anyway, that's uh, not really answered your question, but um, <laughs> that was uh, yeah, basically the kind of situation that my grandfather found himself in. But as for uh, you know, uh, links with the BNHS, I'm not sure. Thank you for the question anyway. Any other questions? Thank you. There's a uh, question in the chat from uh, Olivier oh, yeah. uh, Saurabh. I'm not looking his, at the chat very, yeah, very the, So his, uh, the question is that his Lansdowne home is still standing. Any thoughts of yeah. an interpretation center with his work in it? Well, his uh, Lansdowne home is actually the home of the DFO of the Lansdowne Forest uh, Division. And uh, we went to visit it in 2006 and we were welcomed in and uh, it was in immaculate uh, condition. And uh, I'm still in touch with quite a few people in Lansdowne. And uh, I don't think we could turn it into a, an interpretation centre because it's still in, in use as the DFO's residence. Um, we could perhaps, I don't know, I'm not sure, but it would be a wonderful thing um, to do that. But maybe having a, an interpretation centre in Lansdowne might not be such a good idea. I don't know, because Lansdowne is, not, is perhaps not visited by so many tourists. Um, <coughs> having an interpretation centre perhaps in the Corbett National Park or, or in Ramnagar or uh, perhaps somewhere near the Rajaji National Park might be good. I don't know, but uh, certainly having an interpretation centre would be, would be very nice. Um, and if anybody has any ideas of where that should be, or if you need someone to come and open it, I'll be happy to do so. Uh, I can see that uh, there's a question from Sumanta Ghosh. Yeah, James, I was, in fact, if you can hear me, so this I is, uh, but, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you if there's, a, there's, if there's ever been an offer or if there's ever been, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, an effort made to have a, had a museum or an interpretation of a center, uh, you know, in, in memory of FW, but you have partly answered that question. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, hmm. Well, maybe you would be a very uh, well well positioned person to um, start uh, making the first steps of uh, along those lines, Samantha, because uh, you are based in Ramnagar, and um, yeah, maybe we could think about uh, where to uh, start such a such a centre. Absolutely, yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, of course, Jim Corbett's house is just uh, across the road and a bit further on from your house, uh, and uh, there's a few FW memorabilia in there. Um, so perhaps also somewhere near there could be good um, as the two worked together on the uh, founding of the National Park. That could be- Absolutely, a yeah. That's a, that's a lovely idea actually, yes. you know, because also it is on the way to Nenital and yes. on the other side, you got the Corbett National Park and, you know, so yeah. And, yeah so, exactly. so it's right in the heart of champion country that. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah. So maybe we could uh, we could think about doing it there. Yeah. 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 Uh, there was another uh, of a question that I had. You know, I mean, I think I've mentioned this. I mean, I've asked about this once before, but uh, about Ramsey. You know, Henry Ramsey. Yes. Now, of course, you know, he would have been. You know, uh, had a lot of. You know, he was. He was. Uh, you know, by the. He, he was something who was a. Uh, you know, who was in the administration here and all that. Do you know yeah. of any? 
you know, of any influence that, you know, that FW would have, would have had, you know, or he mentions of FW champion, sorry, FW champion mentions of what, Henry Ramsey? Uh, I don't know of any reference. Um, of course, Henry Ramsey was around long before my grandfather, but yes, you would have thought that there might have been some sort of uh, reference. But uh, to be honest, in my time, no, I don't know of any reference, but that's uh, a very interesting question. I shall... Uh, investigate further because it would be very interesting to know what kind of influence Sir Henry Ram Ramsey had on my grandfather's thinking because yeah. uh, Henry Ramsey was also a great uh, a great person uh, who knew the Kumaun area so well so yeah, yes yeah. good question let's see what we can find out about that yeah because I, I find uh, I find a similarity between both these uh, great people there and the contribution to to conservation and to modern India's conservation, you know, and somehow and somewhere along time, you know, we have kind of forgotten to to pay our sort of thanks to to sort of both of them in a way, and uh, yeah, so that's why yes. I was asking that. Yeah, Thank well, maybe you. we'll have to open a a, a Ramsey interpretation center as well. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, when I was trekking to the Pindari Glacier in 2006, um, the one of the first places I stayed was in the circuit house in Almora, which apparently had belonged to Sir Henry Ramsey. And that uh, was also quite a, an interesting place to, to, to stay. Um, and uh, my grandfather's office uh, as a uh, DFO was just down the road from uh, that circuit house. And we visited his office and um yeah found uh, all his old notebooks and uh, and visitors books and uh, and his name on the board uh you know in in his old office in the forest uh, of the forest uh, department in almora so that was one of the wonderful places that we visited mm. yeah right okay yeah any other questions yeah can i step in um my name yes. is Gopal Ayer. Yeah, hi, hi, James. I kind hi. of joined in a little nice late. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I enjoyed the presentation or whatever I saw of it uh, at the end. But just a Thank quick you. question. I mean, I got a certain sense, but did you in your various, I mean, whatever your uh, kind of uh, search of, of what your grandfather's, um, you know, uh, the, all his work, uh, it would be fascinating to know if there was a sense of what, what our traditional, which is the Indian, local or traditional conservation methodology or methods were? Was there a sense or an appreciation at all? Uh, you, you mean um, among people nowadays or? No, then, at his then. time. I mean, like you, for example, you pointed out how the number of tigers, for example, uh, kind of reduced oh, yes. drastically. So, I mean, in that same vein, I mean, was there, was there a sense, uh, you know, of, well, of, 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 of any native, if I, can, if I can use that, uh, uh, you know, conservation attempt or, or value, if you will. Um, I'm not sure. I know that uh, some of the places where he photographed uh, swamp deer, Barasinga, and uh, some other animals close to what is now the Dudwa National Park, those belonged to... Um, an Indian prince or I think a princess, I'm not sure exactly of her name, but it's mentioned in uh, some of the uh, articles that he wrote about photographing swamp deer. And uh, I think it was a, a princess and uh, she was an active conservationist and tried to uh, protect the, uh, the animals on her land. Um, but I don't know of uh, other Indian conservationists who'd already started their conservation work at that time. Um, but I would imagine there must have been some who had the same kind of ideas that uh, F.W. had. But as I mentioned, you know, F.W. was a man before his time. Not very many people were, uh, were active conservationists in those days. And he even faced opposition from people because uh, they didn't like his conservation ethic. So I don't know. I mean, that's a very good question. Uh, Again, let's see if we can find any more references to uh, Indian conservationists from that time. Good uh, question. Yeah, I, uh, just to add that either it was specific individual efforts or even a generic cultural or civilizational, civilizational ethos, if you will. I mean, it would be interesting to see if there was any, uh, you know, sense of what your grandfather got at that point. Yes. Of time. But yeah, yes. I mean, 
Absolutely. Uh, I, the context is that I think there are value values that we all need to relearn. I mean, uh, where uh, you know, from a, from a civilizational perspective, uh, hum, man was was a part of nature. It's not like yes. nature existed to serve him. And I think this was a fundamental point about our civilization. So it'll yes. be interesting to see if this there was some link to these kind of experiences somewhere. It's a very good question. Uh, let's uh, see what we can find. Okay, I am I see Dr. John Singh. Oh, nice to see you. Yes, very I nice. Know, we never met in Daradun. I, I keep to know about the visit to Daradun and so on. I uh, know. Uh, but it, hopefully I can see you when, uh, when I visit India. I'm kind of hoping to come next year as soon as uh, it becomes possible to, uh, or it, it, it becomes easier to travel. Okay, I live in Bangalore. Yes. I'd love to visit still you. keep traveling. Yeah. Uh, did he mention anything about Dr. Salim Ali in, in, anywhere in his writings? D did he mention anything about what, sorry? Dr. Salim Ali. Salim uh, Ali no, of Bangalore. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Um, I don't know whether they ever met. Um, actually, to be honest, my grandfather was not a great bird man. He was much more of a mammal man. And he didn't really study birds in any great detail. He took some lovely photographs as I, as I showed uh, today, but he wasn't a, a bird lister or anything like that. It was actually my father, Nigel Champion, who was a much more fanatical bird watcher than my grandfather. Um, so I don't, think, uh, they, uh, the, I don't think he ever met Dr. Salim Ali. But uh, it's a, a, another very good question, but I don't think so. Yeah. Just going to jump in here with a question from John Matthew about uh, what was his association with other foresters like uh, Von Ribbentrop? And also, did he work upon forest insects, insect pests? No. Um, his association with other foresters, I would imagine, uh, would have come from the time when he was studying forestry in Oxford. Um, and uh, so he would have uh, met quite a few other European foresters uh, during that time. And I know that he spent some time in Sweden and he also spent some time in Germany and some time in France as a part of his forestry course. So he must have met quite a few German and uh, other European uh, foresters uh, during that time. But I think it was his elder brother, Harry Champion, who really spent much more time communicating with other foresters around the world. Uh, Harry Champion, after he uh, retired, uh, well, after he left the FRI, he went to uh, Oxford and became uh, professor of uh, forestry at Oxford University, uh, a position which he held until 1959. But then he uh, was chairman of the Commonwealth uh, Forestry Association, and he was invited by various different countries to come and do surveys of the forests of, uh, of those particular countries. And after he'd written his uh, Forest Types of India with, uh, with Mr. Sid, he was invited later to come back to India and also to Pakistan, and I think to uh, Sri Lanka, to uh, update the, the book. So I think it was really my great grandfather, uh, sorry, my great uncle, Harry Champion, who communicated with other foresters very much more than my grandfather. I think my grandfather was a practical man. He enjoyed being in the forest. He wasn't uh, such a keen academic and uh, he was uh, much more of a sort of down to earth kind of person. In fact, he was known apparently by his staff as Jolly Champion because he was always laughing and uh, he was a very cheerful man. Um, whereas my great uncle Harry was a much more serious um, and quiet sort of man. Um, so they were, they were quite different in, in, in many ways in, in, in their character. But uh, yeah. So I don't think my grandfather communicated that much with uh, other foresters uh, to answer your question, John. Uh, but what was the other half of your question? I can't remember. Uh, the other part of the question was, uh, did he work at all upon forest insect pests? Oh, yes, that's a very good question. No, he didn't. No, he didn't write any insect uh, papers at all. Um, and I think it was really, uh, again, H.G. Champion who did that. H.G. Champion uh, studied forest entomology. Mm. Uh, and uh, so he wrote a lot of papers about, uh, about that. But I don't think my grandfather did at all. 
And another question is, uh, is a website uh, um, on the cards with his archive online? Ah, that would be very, very nice. Yes, maybe that's another project which will be coming soon. Yes, yes, it would be very nice to have a, a website entirely dedicated to FW Champions uh, work. Nice. Um, so we could have the, uh, the visitor center that we were, or the interpretation center that we were talking about, but also have an online uh, FW Champion archive. One of the difficulties is that um, the original cine films, those 16 millimeter films, were donated by my parents to the Natural History Museum in London in 1988. They'd been kept in a trunk under the stairs in the house in Scotland for a number of years and they'd got damp and they shrank and the perforations down the side of the film uh, split. And so when, uh, when my grandfather and my grandmother tried to uh, organize uh, film evenings, which they sometimes did for their neighbors, there was one particularly terrible time when uh, one of the most prized films split all the way down the, down the side. And after that, my grandfather didn't show his films anymore. He put them in the trunk and left them under the stairs. And when my parents moved to the house in 1988, they opened the trunk and they thought, we can't preserve this material. Let's donate it to the Natural History Museum in London. And obviously they hoped that the Natural History Museum would look after the films and possibly even restore them. But I went to the museum some years later and I had difficulty even getting them to locate where the films were. And finally they found them stacked in a broom cupboard, um, also under some stairs. And uh, so I wasn't very happy about that, but I managed to get them to transfer the films using some special equipment to VHS video, which was then transferred to DVD and of course, each time you change the format, you lose some of the quality. And the original films, I think, are now not viewable anymore. And that's also the case with his glass plate negatives. Unfortunately, they were store, uh, stored <clears throat> excuse me, in wooden boxes and mold grew on the original glass plates. So we can't uh, use them anymore. So we can only work with the prints that were made. And then of course we just have to scan them, but we can't go back to the original format. So that's, uh, that's a, a real pity. And the films, you know, I don't really know how to, I, I don't really know what to do with them exactly. Um, it would be nice to edit them. They have no sound, um, um, but it would be nice to sort of edit them and put them in, in some sort of logical order because of course they're just basically snippets of, 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 of scenes that FW took um, and, you know, he never then arranged them into a proper order. So it would be very nice to perhaps find some professional uh, film editor who could help us to put those into a, a more logical way. And then perhaps I could narrate some sort of background story uh, as, uh, as the films are shown. But that's, that's a possibility. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, another question uh, here is, yep. what do you think was the reason he was a conservationist and not a shikari like the rest of his colleagues? Something in his family background and uh, upbringing must have convinced him early on. Well, I think it may have been partly, as I mentioned, because during the First World War, his brother had been killed and he just didn't like the idea of killing, whether it was humans or, or animals. And although he did continue to do some hunting for the pot, you know, when they were on their trip to the tre trek to the Pindari Glacier, for example, you know, they shot some, uh, some birds to, uh, to eat, but he never enjoyed it after that. And I think it was because of the death of his brother and also because uh, he just didn't like the idea of killing. And in one of his early articles, you know, he says that if he had shot the animal that he'd photographed, then the animal would have quickly become a bloody carcass, as he put it. And uh, none of those wonderful experiences that he and my grandmother had observing the, that animal would have been possible. The animal would have just been dead and it would have, be, would have become a moldy old trophy, which eventually probably would have been thrown away. And all that life would have gone out of the body of that animal. Whereas my grandfather could take photographs of it and put these photographs on his wall back home in Scotland when he eventually retired. And those photographs are still there, you know, and it's just 
something that's almost kind of alive, really. Whereas when uh, you have, uh, you know, a, a, a trophy of a, of a dead tiger or whatever, you know, it doesn't look very nice and it eventually gets very dusty and uh, I don't like to see them. My aunt had one. The, uh, the head was on the ground, on the floor, and the, the skin was up the wall. And, you know, you'd always be falling over the head of this poor tiger. And you think how much nicer it would have been if the tiger had lived its life properly. So I think it was, I think it was that. I don't think it was really my great-grandfather who would have um, encouraged him not to be a shikari um, because my great-grandfather was a great insect collector who must have been responsible for the deaths of I don't know how many millions of insects um, in his collecting. So I don't know whether he had a great sort of conservation ethic, but um, I think they just didn't like, uh, he just didn't like killing. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Udaivi. You've raised your hand. Yes, I can see yeah, yeah, Udaivi. Hi, James. So, yes, hi. Uh, there were two there were two initiatives that uh, your grandfather took. And uh, like you mentioned, he was very ahead of his times. One was the upkeep of the libraries and the forest rest houses when the shikaris came to hunt. Yes. And the, uh, and the other was the, the Canning Benevolent Fund. Yes. Now, that sort of, that has now become sort of a, a dying scheme where the forest guards don't have a fund which exists in, in, in the modern India. Mm. So any insights on how we could probably bring about or probably raise just awareness so that we can uh, suggest the government to come up with a scheme for the forest guards. Mm. Yes, well, I think that's a very, very good idea. And uh, it's certainly true that these forest guards uh, really need a lot of support, I think. And they're very undervalued, uh, perhaps in the enormous contribution they make to uh, protecting the, the forests. Um, I don't have a personal idea of how we could do that, but I think that's a very good thing that we should start thinking about that. So maybe together with some of my friends in India, we'll uh, we'll start thinking about how to uh, to set up such a such a scheme. It's a very good idea. Um, at this very moment, I can't answer exactly, but uh, I shall certainly give it some thought because I think my grandfather would be very pleased if uh, if some sort of uh, uh, fund because or some sort of uh, uh, help was given to those people because they do as, such. As a, I read, as I read, he he yeah, as I as I read, he was the one who started the scheme, actually. Yes, exactly. The fund. Yes. Yeah, but, so in that but case, not... I think perhaps as his grandson, it's maybe my responsibility to uh, to get it back on the road. I'll see what I can do. Excellent suggestion, Uday. Excellent suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, you're very welcome. Another question here is, apart from the two books published, are there more of his written work published and otherwise that can be looked forward to as a complete compiled work? Perhaps uh, uh, well, <laughs> some I of his journeys <laughs> of well, his I time in Tanzania. <laughs> yes, I mentioned Tripwire for a Tiger, which mm -hmm. actually contained half of the articles that he hadn't published, uh, except in the original journals in which they appeared. And very soon... The second volume will be coming. Um, I won't even tell you the title of it, but it's coming quite soon and it'll be a uniform volume with Tripwire for a Tiger so that the two of them will look nice together on, on a bookshelf and possibly even be, you could possibly even put them uh, in, a, in a presentation pack. Um, and that will basically cover pretty much all the writings that FW produced. Uh, except a series of articles which he wrote on forestry, not to do with wildlife conservation, but on the methods used by uh, uh, by foresters and 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 uh, you know how they uh, did their planting schemes and that kind of stuff. They're also very interesting, so we may want to include them in a volume. But what I'd really like to do, to be honest, is to produce a coffee table book with the very best of his photographs and the very best of his writings. Um, so if anybody's uh, able to help me to uh, to put put that together and find a publisher, that might be a, a very nice project. Because in Tripwire and in this new version, it's just a paperback, normal kind of size book. You can't really get the the photographs, you know, produced in a very beautiful way. So I think a big proper coffee table book would be a wonderful thing. 
think uh, yeah we've uh, taken in all the questions uh, kush would you like to wrap up please yes, yes please we've... i think i i i still have gotten one question james so yes. when are you coming to india so that we can go look for that for that foothill stream <laughs> <laughs> well there's one possibility that i might be able to come to india in march um really? it's not certain yet i'm now in japan uh and i'm on a short term teaching contract which ends in february um at the moment my plan is to return to europe um uh, after that but i could possibly change the plan um and if it's if i don't do that then i'm almost certain to come to india not next summer but next autumn or next winter so that would be the winter of 2022 So if the foothill stream can wait that long and if you can wait kush then maybe we can look for it then. Sure sure. Yeah. I think I'm unlikely to come in the summer because I don't like hot weather. So uh I think uh, maybe from November to March might be uh, a good time for me to come. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Anybody yes, else? Yes. Right, Kush, are you going to wrap up then? Uh, yeah, so Manta said is here. So Manta said, are you going to? Oh, well, uh, yeah, so uh, um, thank you so much. You know, thank you so much, James, to just to, to uh, I mean, take us through this fantastic journey of how our uh, journeys were. Yeah, it's always, it's always so nice to, to be able to interact with you. Of course, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege to be um, traveling with you and, you know yes. spend some amazing moments and uh, i will you know the and the rosemary journey that you mentioned of so yeah it's been it's been great so yeah and i know we have sort of overshot with the with the time it's uh, it's about 6:30 now here and okay. yeah, so all i would say is that to me, thank you so much thank well, you well thank you very much to all of you um, yeah. for attending and also to those of you who organized it it's been really great Absolutely. and, and uh, to the participants yes, i look forward to yeah. meeting as many of you as possible when i come to india whenever that may be absolutely same yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely so we Thank have so we much have a, uh, we have made a small video of uh, um, you know all the pictures of uh, fw and uh, the photographs which he took it is on the uh, one ghats instagram page so anyone of you who wants to see it uh, it's a 2 minute video and all the you know those important photographs are there so yeah sounds great so yes shall we wrap up <clears throat> okay yes. goodbye everybody yes yeah. thank you thank, thank you, you so much. very much yes thank you okay thank you everyone thank you for joining thank you yes okay thank you very Bye. much